This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heather. I'm the coordinator of Province 5, and you are at the Dismantling Racism Network meeting on March 2nd, 2023. Uh, we are grateful that you have joined us either here in person or in the recording. Uh, and we are very grateful for the work of Sister Veronica Dunbar, who will be speaking with us today. Well, good morning. So I'm going to open us with a prayer that I'm borrowing from um, the Church of the Province of the West Indies. So let us pray. Almighty God, the privilege is ours to share in the loving healing, reconciling mission of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in this age and wherever we are. Since without you we can do no good thing, may your Spirit make us wise. May your Spirit guide us. May your Spirit renew us. May your Spirit strengthen us, so that we will be strong in faith, discerning in proclamation, courageous in witness, and persistent in good deeds. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and to, to give a little bit of background. Um, here in the Diocese of Michigan, we started um, our reparations research really full steam ahead in 2021. And what we, were, we did first was we interviewed um, other dioceses and in institutions who had done reparations work. And we wanted to learn best practices from them so that as our Bishop says, we could make new mistakes rather than repeating old ones. So we, we talked to the Diocese of Texas, the Diocese of Maryland, the Diocese of Rhode Island and Virginia Theological Seminary about their reparation programs um, to see what, you know, what we could use in our context and what, what wouldn't work. And I also, ended up speaking very recently to the Diocese of Massachusetts, who started their fund um, just in their past uh, convention in October. So I'm going to share my screen to show where we are right now and what we've learned. And you guys can see that OK? So we decided to call what we would call our reparations program, Repairing the Breach. And we are basically founding what we're doing on Isaiah 58, which will be really familiar to all of us because we just read it on Ash Wednesday. And it's giving us um, that kind of biblical foundation to what we're doing. And we're hoping that that will cut through some of the, I, some of the more lightning rod aspects of what the word reparations has taken on. So that's where we're starting. And we wanted to lay out a clear theological, spiritual and biblical basis of what we're doing. We wanted it to be clear that this is not what we would call a social justice program. And in fact, we're not gonna use the phrase social justice um, we're talking about, we're going to use the terms of discipleship and prophetic witness. So we're using the language of Isaiah 58 to really ground what we're doing in the biblical prophetic witness. One thing we learned um, throughout our conversations and our research is we have to be true to our context. The other um, diocese we spoke with had their, their reparations was based around slavery. Here in Michigan, that's much less of an issue. So when we're looking at where we need to repair the breach, we're focusing on the present inequities that are the legacy of past institutional and systemic racism. And we're saying this is not about writing a check to certain people, this is about our accountability as people of faith to our sisters, brothers, and siblings, and for the injustices that 
that they have experienced and that have been perpetuated on behalf of the dominant culture. So here in our context, the, the, real, the, the biggest issue for us historically has been in housing inequities that were the result of redlining. So we were looking at these kind of these points about, okay, where are we seeing the legacy of the past institutional racism in our context? So we had housing, education, mass incarceration, or if you wanna call it the uh, school to prisons pipeline, health disparities, especially access to good healthcare, food deserts, um, finding access to healthy food and to being able to grow healthy food, which has been a huge movement, particularly in the city of Detroit lately, and also voting access. So we, we're gonna begin by listening. Just this, well, just this past month, we had a focus group to help shape the listening sessions that we're going to hold. These listening sessions will be to, um, hear what people are feeling and thinking about the idea of reparations. So our focus group was made up of people of African descent. We realized that, that in our context, those are the people most impacted. So we wanted to hear their voices first and to let them shape what we were gonna ask and how we were, gonna, we were going to proceed. We looked at ways of shaping these, these listening sessions. Um, in talking to the Diocese of Massachusetts, they shaped theirs so that they were all on Zoom uh, it, for two reasons. It allowed better, better time management and geography is not, was not a barrier. That's a huge issue in our, our diocese is making sure that people can attend and that they're not worried about driving someplace and that holds them back. The time management issue is so that we can make sure everyone has a chance to speak. You know, Zoom has a mute button. <laughs> and it is much easier to, if we're going to allot time for each speaker to say, you have two and a half minutes. After two and a half minutes, we're going to mute you graciously and lovingly, but we're going to mute you. And that makes sure that no one takes over the room and everyone gets a chance to express themselves. Our other concern was, well, if we're in person, there's gonna be a greater sense of fellowship and it'll be easier for us who are gathering the data from the listening sessions to read the room. What our focus group settled on, which you'll see highlighted in blue, is to do both. We'll offer Zoom only and in-person only. We don't want to deal with trying to do hybrid because sometimes wrangling the technology can get in the way of our really being present to one another. And we decided we didn't want to do that. And it was the best way we could think of to getting the upsides of both, both ways. So we will have both Zoom only and in-person only um, for our listening sessions. The first session, first sessions will only be for people of African descent because we wanna make the, sure that their voices are heard first. And then we'll, we will be broadening it out to the rest of the diocese. And we also want to make sure um, that we include a special session for our young people. We're thinking of EYE aged young people um, so basically ninth through 12th grade plus people from the age of about 19 to 25. We wanna make sure that we hear their voices very distinctly and they don't get lost in, in the broader context. One of the things I learned from the Diocese of Massachusetts was to be prepared for potential blowback. One of the reasons that we convened this focus group is when we started, you know, sort of putting feelers out there about this discussion, people of color were worried about damaging their interactions with white congregations in particular. Um, you know, in many ways, 
you know, some have really good relationships, but some are these sort of very tentative, fragile, we're getting along and being kind to each other, but we don't have real relationship. And people were worried about upsetting that. And so part of what we, our work is going to be is saying, okay, then that means we need to build better and stronger relationships rather than stepping back and being afraid to talk to each other. That's going to be a lot of work. And that's going to, that's going to take work beyond just our reparations process. That's going to be reflected in our anti-racism curriculum and the con conversations around that to give people the, the skills to start building stronger relationships. Um, another thing that the Diocese of Massachusetts heard and that we've heard as well is it's, it's both a real concern and it's a bit of a deflection. People will say, oh, but, but, but what about X, Y, or Z? Massachusetts called it the, but what about me question? Um, I'm sorry, Maryland, but, but what about me? Because Maryland in Western Maryland, they had coal miners who were severely affected both by um, corporate, it's not even mismanagement, corporate greed and, you know, corporate exploitation. And so they had, they had a real argument for a legacy of um, sort of a, a legacy of official abuse, really. And then in the Diocese of Massachusetts, the sort of deflection question was, well, what about indigenous people? And so what we learned from both of them is we need to be prepared to respond to that. Here in the Diocese of Michigan, we are starting to do indigenous people's ministries as parallel to our repairing relationship with people, people of African descent. So we're running those two parallel to make it clear that uh, our mission for spirituality and racial repair is a broad mission and it's not just for, for people of African descent. And that will make it clear that this act of discipleship, this part of discipleship is very broad. It's not narrow. And that's going to be part of our response. Um, so the questions that we'll be asking in our listening sessions, they're deliberately broad. Um, what do you think of when you hear the word reparations? What are your hopes in this process? And what are your concerns? We have to make it clear during our listens, listening sessions, and this is something that I learned from the Diocese of Massachusetts, it's not a time to argue your position. When you have those two or three minutes to speak in the listening session, it's not to you know, say, well, we shouldn't be doing this because, or we should be doing this because. What we really need to hear, what is really valuable for us is to be able to listen and to understand how people feel. So those questions about hopes and concerns, that's what we need to know. And to make it clear that, you know, no, we're not gonna spend this time arguing your position with one another or with us. We just wanna hear how you feel. And if you say, this is terrifying, this is going to wreck our relationships with between white and black churches or whatever, that's that's what we need to hear, not that I don't think you should do this because. The Diocese of Massachusetts made that very clear um, by putting out a very clear statement that was read at the beginning of each listening session. I am in the process of drafting that statement so that people can understand basically what the ground rules are. What, how are we framing this process and what is it for so that we don't get sidetracked into conversations or just arguments that don't that, that don't move us forward or give us a deeper understanding of what our concerns, hopes, and wishes are. So one of the things that, that came out from our focus group was that they did not want to tiptoe around the word reparations. 
they wanted to reclaim and reframe it. They realized that it's, it, you know, it's become a polarizing word, that it can be sort of a political lightning rod. And they said, you know what, let's take this word and let's, let's reframe it as the work of the discipleship, discipleship in repairing the breach. In other words, let's ground it in that biblical and theological narrative. So we're gonna begin the process by listening to people of African descent. And the questions, the sessions to the broader community will have questions appropriate to that demographic. So like I mentioned, we want to do sessions for EYE aged youth and for young people between 19 and 25. And we want to be able to, to draw from them as much information about how they feel about this process as we can. So we're going to massage those questions somewhat to make them appropriate for which, what demographic we're, we're addressing. Another thing, and this is a little bit farther ahead than where we are right now, because right now we are in, we're drafting those listening sessions. The Diocese of Massachusetts they, they started securing seed money for their ref, reparations fund as soon as possible. And we realized the need to do that in our diocese was because in the past, we've had exercises around racial repair that ended up being perceived, and sometimes they actually were, just exercises that resulted in no real action. And so we have some trust building to do to say this is not just going to be a bunch of talking and listening sessions that go nowhere. We need to be able to say, oh, we're already making these concrete steps so that when you contribute to this process, it's going to matter. It's going to result in something. And that kind of trust building is going to be both within our listening sessions. And it's also going to be part of um, what we do as part of our anti-racism curriculum and as, as the mission for spirituality and race and the, the other events and conversations we can have to start rebuild that trust to say that this isn't just going to go nowhere. That this is, this is something that we recognize that we need to do in response to our prophetic call, our baptismal covenant, who we are as people of faith, and that's why we have to walk through it. So let me stop sharing and let's, let's think about any questions that you have. Um, let me say a couple of words about the anti-racism curriculum that we did, which is really undergirding um, in many ways, our reparations process because we realized we needed a huge continuing education piece so that reparations would make sense and would have some context within um, our calling as people of faith. We used um, the ECAR framework for our, for our anti-racism curriculum and we wanted to make sure that it we're moving people away from the idea of the one and done workshop to saying, no, this is lifelong learning. This is continuing education. This is what we need to do to know and understand one another as a community. So that is going along. It's another parallel to reparations that we recognized we needed as an education piece um, so that you know, we could open that door to people understanding why reparations, you know, particularly as framed as Isaiah, in Isaiah, is part of our prophetic call and part of our prophetic witness. So those are, there are some other things kind of running alongside reparations to support it. And that is one of the things that, that we're doing is that continuing education piece. Okay, I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> Any comments or questions or thoughts um, that you that you found helpful or that you needed a little bit more information on doing? Yes, Adrian. Can you 
say a little bit more about what sort of education or training you're doing to lay the groundwork for the prophetic witness? Yeah, so um, when when I framed our anti-racism curriculum, I did it in, in three steps, starting with a broad understanding of uh, the legacy of racism in America. So those were kind of the, the broad overview. And I picked a number of sources. So yes, there are books, but there are also things like podcasts and interviews for people to interact with. So that's not all reading. And after each section, I, sec I put them into modules. Each section is um, concludes in a facilitated conversation about the materials in that module. So um, the first module, it's, it's kind of a broad, you know, broad, under, broad understanding of racism in, in America. The books were um, The Some of Us by Heather McGee. You could choose that one. You could choose Cast by Isabel Wilk Wilkerson, or you could choose How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And then I put a, a small piece on the doctrine, doctrine of discovery, and then a selection of podcasts, and um, I think I might have had a PBS frontline in there as well that people could watch or listen to. And so that module one just complete, concluded um, last week. We ended up having seven sessions for people to have their concluding conversations. And it was really just sharing, wow, what was new to you? What was familiar? You know, what, what does this mean in your context? what lingering questions do you have that went unanswered to to get people to start thinking about what we're doing in this education piece this is actually part of our discipleship it's not a social justice program it's part of how we become community um, so the second module is a little bit more focused on our diocese the area in our diocese and what really affected affects us. So we have something, one of the books is The Color of Law um, that, you know, looks at redlining basically and how that affects segregated, segregated communities within any, any area. And our last module will be about transformative action. We're gonna use Stephanie Speller's book, The Church Cracked Open and say, okay, we've, we've done this time of learning. How are we gonna put it in action in, in, our, in our community? What does that look like in our context? And it's the curriculum spread out between over at least a minimum of three months. For a lot of people, it'll be closer to five months. And that was deliberate to get away from the idea of the one Saturday workshop where you get your certificate and said, yes, I did my anti-racism anti training and you don't have to think about it for another three years. That makes no sense and it doesn't accomplish anything. So that's that was what we were doing. And we will continue to update the materials. And once we've kind of gone through one cycle, there will be continue more continuing education possibilities beyond just the basic curriculum. So that's that's the hope. That's how we framed it. And we're hoping with the understanding of how we got to where we are broadly as a nation, how we got to where we are just in the context of our diocese, and then what we are called to do about it as people of faith, that going through those steps in a fairly in-depth way will help people understand that hmm, if we're called to be repairers of the breach, this is something we have to do. If we see the legacies of injustice and inequities around, inequity around us, we are called to respond. How do we do that? And it's also really important to say that we're not gonna be doing things starting from scratch. We're really gonna be looking to partner with local organizations who are already doing this work so that we're not reinventing the wheel and we're also bearing public witness that as people of faith we think this is our work to do as well out in the broader community 
Does that help, Adrian? Thank you. I'm looking for ideas for our own diocese. <laughs> yes, M.E. I, I have some suspicions, but could you say some more about why you've chosen deliberately to move away from social justice and toward discipleship as the language? Well, it's, it's the, we're, we're moving toward the understanding that part of prophetic witness, part of our call as people of faith is to in fact, you know, recognize and work against injustice, inequity, to understand and to do something about suffering when we see it and to get away from this sort of separation that we that we've kind of historically had in the church that social justice is something we do outside the walls and outside the church it's for good secular agencies who you know want to do political activism and thing like things like that mm-hmm. and we want to pull back that pull that back and say actually as part of our call of the baptized respecting the dignity of every human being <laughs> you know this this is actually who we are as people of faith it's not some separate secular program this isn't social justice this is discipleship this is the call of the baptized and so we wanted to really really emphasize that and make that clear so yeah we we made the decision we're not going to be using that phrase social justice we're going to be talking about our baptismal covenant and, you know, our discipleship. And that's part of, you know, why the mission is for spirituality and racial repair, because this is actually part of our spiritual formation. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Newland and then Felicity. Thank you. Right. I, I just have a question about module two. Uh, will part of that work be what's called truth telling, where you all will interrogate your own Dawson history, possibly even the archives, to document how the legacy of slavery has played itself concretely in your diocese and in the congregations? Yeah. And, and because, you know, ours is not so much about the legacy of slavery as it is about um, particularly redlining and discriminatory housing and what was called urban renewal and slum clearance, which was just really the destruction of black and brown neighborhoods. So we're looking at that and we are really, really blessed in that we have, um, particularly in the city of Detroit, they have an official historian and So there we have between that, the Detroit Historical Society and the Michigan Historical Society access to really, really good documentation and some really talented people who know how to gather histories. So we will be partnering with them and we also need to look at our own archives because even though we were not a slave state, there were a lot of people and quite a few of them Episcopalians who ended up making a lot of money based on um, the exploitation of enslaved people. And so that, yeah, that will be part of our our deep dive is, you know, okay, we have to gather together our archivists (laughs) because we need need to find out as full a picture of who we were and how we got to who we are as we can, because that is that truth telling is part of that ECAR framework for anti-racism. Thank you very much. Felicity. Hi, Sister V. So regard, thank you first of all for doing this. Regarding the um, educational arm of this, are you planning age-appropriate materials for the children? 
Yes, because we have an absolutely wonderful, you know, youth and young adult missioner named Carmen, <laughs> Carmen Higgins. And so we have been getting together to look at what kind of um, what kind of materials we can use, both for um, educating children, but also um, we had two priests get together with Carmen and say, we want to put together a program that helps parents raise anti-racist anti -racist children. So thankfully, I have help. <laughs> so Carmen has been working really, really hard with that. And we've been kind of working together, looking at materials and programs that, that seem um, appropriate and have good theology behind them, because that's really, really important. So Carmen has been working with the program, Tell Me the Truth About Racism, uh, which came out of Chicago. And so they've done some training already for sort of the train the trainer, and she'll be working with them more as, as we move ahead. So that gives, that gives trainers and people to work with in their congregations to start educating children. And also, um, thanks to the two priests, Jean Hansknecht and Ann Clark, um, they're starting to work on a book to help guide parents in, as, in how they're going to raise their children to be anti-racist. And that just, that starts, I think, next week. So that's kind of, that's kind of in the trial mode. Mm -hmm. But once we get feedback from them, um, Carmen and I are going to do our best to, you know, see hey, how can, how can we spread this throughout the diocese so that people have the tools and resources to do that? Thank you. Anyone else? Any, any other comments or questions? Yes, Adrian. So where do you see the truth telling as playing a part in preparing the groundwork for reparations? Because of course that's the part that usually brings blowback and well, why are you doing this? And why are you making us feel bad? How do you see that as critical to the rest of what you're doing. Right. So that is that was the the part of our anti-racism curriculum that comes out in the facilitated conversations. Mm -hmm. Those are the encounters where we get to ask hard questions. Well, I will ask the hard question <laughs> and facilitate the conversations between people who have engaged in the materials. Um, and that does two things. It is about the truth telling, but it also begins to equip people who are willing to enter those conversations to take those conversations further. Um, a lot of people have a level of discomfort of, I'm gonna say the wrong thing. You know, um, I had one person tell me, I wanna do this, but I don't wanna look like the bad white person. <laughs> and so they felt paralyzed about having these conversations. So in those facilitated conversations that close out each module of the anti-racism curriculum training, we're doing the truth telling because we're looking at, well, we're looking at the true history of, of who we are and how we got here. And we're, we're making space for people to share their own experiences. And because, I mean, it's, in many ways, it's, it's, you're, you're rolling the dice because you'll never know who you're going to get in that, that conversation together, but it allows people who might not otherwise have ever talked to one another to hear each other's experiences. And that's also the part of the truth telling. Sister V, thank you so much 
for all of that information. Um, we are grateful. So I'm going to stop recording and we can continue on with the meeting, but round of applause for Sister V. Yay.